Oh yeah, yeah. Not fifty-two. Fine. Yeah. I'm okay. I make sure that that's live. Yeah, and um, nobody's joining us, but I'll I'll mention. There you are. You see? Okay. You see it. So uh, we're. Uh, yeah, you get the like button. Thanks, guys. <laughs> <laughs> This is awesome, but uh, um, I don't. People can't really review this past. Um, when more people join, I'm supposed to remind them that we can take comments through there. And um, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so I'll, I'll say that at the end, though. Looks like nobody's okay. So Genesis 36. So let's recap uh, what happened before this. Does anybody? Should I recap? The deaths of Rachel and Isaac. Mm. I don't even remember. Yeah. Let me flip back a chapter here. I just read it from I cheated. <laughs> I know I read it too. Just don't tell me that. <laughs> Wait, you're filled with wisdom. <laughs> Jacob returns to Bethel. That's what happened. Like, yeah, okay. yeah. Um, so uh we had Jacob running away from Esau, um, who was gonna kill him. Jacob returns to Bethel, which is the name of a church in Redding, California, but it's also the just a place that they were living in the Middle East. I think it's just northeast of Jerusalem. Um, Esau didn't want to kill him. They're brothers. They hugged. They embraced. Things were good. Um, Jacob wrestled with God. And then Rachel... Could be pronounced also Raquel died <laughs> last last time, and so that Why that is the wife of uh, the wife of uh, not Rachel, <laughs> uh, Isaac Jacob. Yes, wife of Jacob. Yes. Okay, and we're basically God is forming a country right now through these people. So these people they're so early in the land and they settle it. Like if we got there early, it would be the land of Nathan. <laughs> land of Darren, <coughs> land of Raquel, even though there weren't female names. But or here's rock. The, land of rock. the land of rock. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, so we have, let's read the very last line before in Genesis 35. Um, 27. Oh, gee, Jacob died, yeah. These were the sons of Jacob in thirty in twenty six thirty five twenty six, uh, chapter thirty five verse twenty six. Uh, these were the sons of Jacob who were born him, to him in Padan Aram. Jacob came home to his father Isaac in Mamre near Kiriath Arba, that is in Hebron, where Abraham and Isaac had stayed. Isaac lived a hundred and eighty years. Then he breathed his last, and he died, and he was gathered to his people, old and full of years. And his sons Esau and Jacob buried him. So we are on the next one. And then uh, as for the roles, basically we'll just read along. And then as we go, we can pick out roles and things like that and, and do different voices. It's nice. Um, it makes the dialogue clearer when there's two people talking. Raquel, did you want to be the narrator again tonight? Yeah. Okay. So we'll be on. Does that mean I'm going to read this whole chapter? This whole. Oh wait! Oh, I'm sorry. So I'm taking Genesis 36 one. So we're going to skip. So this is the account of the family line of Esau, that is Edom. Esau took his wives from the women of Canaan. Um, and then then basically it's ra it's reading off names, um, which I'm going to skip. Um. It says in four, these are the sons of Esau, which were born to him in Esau. Uh, 36, six is important. Esau took his wives and sons and daughters and all the members of his household, as well as his livestock and all his other animals and all the goods he had acquired in Canaan and moved to a land some great distance from his brother Jacob. Their possessions were too great for them to remain together. Their land they were staying could not support them because of their livestock. 
So Esau settled in the country, hill country of Seir. Now that's like the only paragraph, the only narrative. The rest of it are listing out family lines and things like that. Um, but that paragraph in particular is important because we see that God prophesied. Or does anybody? I mean, I'll just say it. Say what I think. Um, God prophesied that um, Jacob, Jacob would Esau would serve Jacob, the older would serve the younger, and we see that he's separating them into two different peoples right now, and it's because of a very simple thing: they have lots of farm animals, and farm animals eat grass, and they don't have you know their farm animals probably started to die, and so they they had to move. So it's a very simple thing, but God used nature to fulfill his promises. And we see that, that there's a setup. So Jacob is staying in the land um, and he's basically inheriting what's rightfully his. Um, and God is fulfilling the promise through something very, as simple as grass. And I love how it's that simple. Um, we'll see a lot of reasons, a lot of huge spiritual reasons can be settled by one simple thing. Um, and then it goes down. The only other thing that I found that was interesting was in chapter in Genesis, chapter 36, verses 16. We have the name Korah, and it says, uh, The sons of Eliphaz, the firstborns of Esau, the chiefs Taman, Omar, Zepho, Kanaz, Korah, Gatam, Amalek. These were the chiefs descended from Eliphaz in Edom, and they were grandsons of Adah. The Interesting note there that I found in Korah was that that's the same Korah where in the Psalms it talks about sons of Korah, and they ended up being like ministers of music in the house of God. So you'll you'll see reading in the Psalms. This is this is I think it's in the later Psalms too, like past Psalm 100. It'll say this is a Psalm of the sons of Korah, and that they're descendants of Esau. Mm. And so we know that Esau was. In general, a good guy, he may not have inherited the promise of Israel. Christ doesn't come through the line of Esau, comes through the line of um, Isaac, Jacob, his brother. Um, and um, But he's still, I take that as he's not a bad guy. He still has good descendants, good things are coming from him. So... Um, but does anybody have any comments about that chapter? No. So, okay. so, yeah, so it says their positions were too great. I think it's interesting that mm-hmm. how God separated uh, Jacob and Esau is the same way he separated Abraham from Lot. Yeah. The land could support them. Yeah. Yeah, that's, yeah, that's another good, good point. Mm-hmm. That's basically what... Mm-hmm. I was going to say pretty much yeah. along those lines. So, yeah. No, oh, okay. Yeah, so, I didn't pick that up. When you run out of grass, you got to move. When you run out of grass, you got to move your butt. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Let's see if anybody has joined in. So, let's go to Genesis 37. And oh, we're already having comments. Yeah. Are these mean comments. The setup. Huh? Is there any way I can make it easier for you to get by me? I should just move this over here temporarily. What's up, Mark? Hey, watch out. There's a chair right behind you. Jordan and Mark. Good to have you guys. Oh. <laughs> Sorry, I'm trying to make it easier and I made it harder. Yeah. I had to figure that pull out right there. Yeah. <laughs> I'm pull out my chair at the last second. <laughs> um, oh, man, I might be able to. to uh, Thanks. Yeah. No, I'll just barrel through. Put it, put it over yeah. here. So let me. Or you can. Um, I can make it larger, probably. Yeah, I made it a little larger here. Okay, cool. So now we now I can see the comments a little easier, but. Uh, cool, but no no questions so far. So. Cool. So we're in uh, Genesis 37, and then as we get to a different role, we can divvy out the roles. Uh, did you want to? St- Are you okay? Yeah, my my left eye was stinging, but I'm good. Okay. Hmm. Um. 
itchy earlier. It's just stuff. Okay. Hey, Raider. Sure. <clears throat> Who's the, who, are there any characters? Yeah, but uh, I didn't divvy them out ahead of time, so. It looks like the first one are Joseph. <laughs> so. I'll, I'll be Joseph. Oh, oh, you'll be Joseph? Okay. Yeah. And then I'll, I'll be Joseph's brothers, his evil brothers. <laughs> um, and then I think that's probably it. If we get more people, we can figure it out. Okay. So. <clears throat> Jacob lived in the land where his father had stayed, the land of Canaan. This is the account of Jacob. Joseph, a young man of 17, was tending the flocks with his brothers, the sons of Bilhah and the sons of Zilpah, his father's wives, and he brought their father a bad report about them. Now Israel loved Joseph more than any of his other sons, because he had been born to him in his old age, and he made a richly ornamented robe for him. When his brothers saw that their father loved him more than any of them, they hated him and could not speak a kind word to him. Joseph had, dream, had a dream, and when he told it to his brothers, they hated him all the more. He said to them, Listen to this dream I had. We were binding sheaves of grain out in the field, when suddenly my sheaf rose and stood up right. All your sheaves gathered around mine and bowed down to it. His brothers said to him, Do you intend to reign over us? Will you actually rule us? And they hated him all the more because of his dream and what he had said. Then he had, an then he had another dream and he told it to his brothers. Listen, he said, I had another dream and this time the sun and moon and 11 stars were bowing down to me. When he told his father as well, his brothers, his father, as his brothers, his father rebuked him and said, Darren, you want to be a... Uh... Yeah. What is this dream you had? Will your mother and I and your brothers actually come and bow down to the ground before you? His brothers were jealous of him, but his father kept the matter in mind. Now his brothers had gone to graze their father's flocks near Shechem, and Israel said to Joseph, What should you do? Oh, no. As you know, your brothers are grazing the flocks near Shechem. Come, I am going to send you to them. And then, very well. He replied. So he said to him. Does that mean? Uh, yeah, yeah, that I think that you did. Go and see if all is well with your brothers and with the flocks, and bring back, or bring word back to me. Then he sent him off from the valley of Hebron. When Joseph arrived at Shechem, a man found him wandering around in the fields and asked him, um, What are you looking for? He replied, I'm looking for my brothers. Can you tell me where they are gazing their flocks? They've moved on from here. The man answered. I heard them say, let's go to Dothan. So Joseph went after his brothers and found them near Dothan. Dothan, <laughs> but they saw him in the distance, and before he reached them, they plotted to kill him. Here comes that dreamer, they said to each other. Come now, let's kill him and throw him into one of these cisterns and say that a ferocious animal devoured him. Then we'll see what comes of his dreams. When Reuben heard this, he tried to rescue him from their hands. Bryce, do you want to be Reuben? Good. Mom, do you want to be Reuben? Oh, sure. Uh, we're, we're on 21. Okay. Let's not take his life. He said. Don't shed any blood. Throw him into the cistern here in the desert, but don't lay a hand on him. Reuben said this to rescue him from them and take him back to his father. So when Joseph came to his brothers, they stripped him of his robe, the richly ornamented robe he was wearing, and they took him and threw him into the cistern. Now the cistern was empty. There was no water in it. When they sat down to eat their meal, they looked up and saw a caravan of Ishmaelites Ishmael coming from Gilead. Their camels were loaded with spices, balm, and myrrh, and they were on their way to take them down to Egypt. Judah said to his brothers, um, 
What will we gain if we kill our brother and cover up his blood? Come, let's sell him to the Ishmaelites and not lay our hands on him. After all, he is our brother, our own flesh and blood. His brothers agreed. So when the Midianite merchants came by, his brother, his brothers pulled Joseph up out of the cistern and sold him for 20 shekels of silver to the Ishmaelites, who took him to Egypt. When Reuben returned to the cistern and saw that Joseph was not there, he tore his clothes. He went back to his brothers and said, um, I think this is my mom. Yeah. Mom? The boy isn't there. Where can I turn now? Then they got Joseph's robe, slaughtered a goat, and dipped the robe in the blood. They took the ornamented robe back to their father and said, We found this. Examine it to see whether it is your son's robe. He recognized it and said, I think that's there. It is my son's robe. Some ferocious animal has devoured oh. him. Oh, oh that's you. No, it is. <laughs> Some ferocious animal has devoured him. Joseph has surely been torn to pieces. Then Jacob tore his clothes, put on sackcloth, and mourned for his son many days. All his sons and daughters came to comfort him, but he refused to be comforted. That's you. Yeah. No. He said. And mourning, oh, well, is that me again? Yeah. In mourning will I go down to the grave to my son. So his father wept for him. Meanwhile, the Midianites sold Joseph in Egypt to Potiphar, one of Pharaoh's officials, the captain of the guard. Cool. And then um, I guess we can take questions at the end. I know that I'm like, this is a cool story because I have seen the cartoon. Mm -hmm. So I'm like following it with like images in my mind as we're reading it. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's cool. And then, so now, okay, so 37, the narrative ends, and it's kind of going on Joseph, um, and it returns in 39, but 38, it's kind of a side chain. Mm. So we have these evil brothers. They, they, murdered, they murdered when they re took revenge on their sister getting raped, they, and that they're kind of continuing in their tradition. They're bad dudes. They're turning into bad dudes. The, the whole time, um, anyway, um, so, but just to just to let us know what's happening in thirty-eight, I guess we should, we could keep reading. Yeah. Yeah. At that time, Judah left his brothers and went down to stay with a man of Adullam named Hira. Excuse me. There, Judah met there. Judah met the daughter of Canaanite man named Shua. He married her and lay with her. She became pregnant and gave birth to a son, who was named Ur. She conceived again and gave birth to a son and named him Onan. She gave birth to still another son and named him Shelah. It was at Kazib that she gave birth to him. Judah got a wife for Ur, his firstborn, and her name was Tamar. But Ur, Judah's firstborn, was wicked in the Lord's sight, so the Lord put him to death. Then Judah said to Onan, Sleep with your brother's wife and fulfill your duty to her as a brother-in-law. To raise up offspring for your brother. But Ona knew that the offspring would not be his. So whenever he lay with his brother's wife, he spilled his semen on the ground to keep from producing offspring for his brother. What he did was wicked in the Lord's sight, so he put him to death also. Judah then said to his daughter-in-law, Tamar, Live as a widow in your father's household until my son Sheila grows up. For he thought, He may die too, just like his brother's. So Tamar went to live in her father's house. After a long time, Judah's wife, the daughter of Shua, died. When Judah had recovered from his grief, he went up to Timnah, to the men who were shearing his sheep, and his friend Hirah, the Adulamite, went with him. When Tamar was told, Your father-in-law is on his way to Timnah to shear his sheep. She took off her widow's clothes, covered herself with a veil to disguise herself, and then sat down at the entrance to Enaim, <laughs> which is on the road to <clears throat> Timnah. <clears throat> Excuse me. For she saw that though Shelah had now grown up, she had not been given to him as his wife. When Judah saw her, he thought she was a prostitute, for she had covered her face. 
not realizing that she was his daughter-in-law, he went over to her by the roadside and said, Come now, let me sleep with you. Um, Mom, did you want to be Tamar? Sure. Uh, so we're in uh, verse 15, um, and you'll be saying, your first word is and. Okay. And what will you give me to sleep with you? She asked. I'll send you a young goat from my flock. He said. Will you give me something <coughs> as a pledge until you spend it? She asked. He said. What pledge should I give you? Your seal and its cord and the staff in your hand. She answered. So he gave them to her and slept with her, and she became pregnant by him. After she left, she took off her veil and put on her widow's clothes again. <clears throat> Meanwhile, Judah sent the young goat by his friend, the Adamite, in order to get his pledge back from the woman, but he did not find her. He asked the men who lived there, Where is the shrine prostitute who is beside the road in Enon? There hasn't. Oh. Um, <laughs> do you, um, does anybody want to say the next There hasn't been any shrine prostitute here, they said. So he went back to Judah and said, I didn't find her. Besides, the men who lived there said, There hasn't been any shrine prostitute here. Then Judah said, Darren, do you want to be Judah? Sure. Cool. Let her keep what she has, or we will become a laughing stock. After all, I did send her this young goat, but you didn't find her. About three months later, Judah was told. You, your daughter-in-law, Tamar, is guilty of prostitution, and as a result, she's now pregnant. Judah said, Bring her out and have her burned to death. And she was being brought, as she was being brought out, she sent a message to her father-in-law. <clears throat> Mom? I am pregnant by the man who owns these, she said. And she added, See if you recognize whose seal and cord and staff <laughs> these are. Judah recognized them and said, She is more righteous than I, since I wouldn't give her to my son Shelah. And he did not sleep with her again. When the time came for her to give birth, there were twin there were twin boys in her womb. As she was giving birth, one of them put his hand out his hand, so the midwife took a scarlet thread and tied it on his wrist and said, This one came out first. <laughs> but when he drew back his hand, his brother came out and she said, So this is how you've broken out. And he was named Perez. Then his brother, who had the scarlet thread on his wrist, came out, and he was given the name Zerah. Cool. And per Perez means breaking, breaking out. out. And Zerah means scarlet, scarlet. or bright. Mm, yeah. <laughs> Beat me to it. Cool. And so that that is important later on. Um, I was starting to watch a commentary, and it basically said that uh, Judah made a total 180. Like, he was kind of with his brothers. He was murdering. Um, and, and he, like when, during the, at the end of that chapter, I guess he made a big conscious decision to not be evil anymore. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, it picks up a little bit later on, like in 42 or something like that. Um, but that's important because later on in Israel's history, Judah becomes an actual nation in and of itself. Mm -hmm. And there's actually two nations. And they're actually much larger and much stronger. And they do all the battling and all the fighting. Yeah. It's it's almost as if God um, was like, okay, you want to go out and murder people? Well, you're now going to be the the fighter. You're going to be the warrior. You know, you're going to be fighting for the rest of your life. Mm -hmm. But um, but anyway, um, but that that being said, we're now switched to thirty nine, which is a continuation of Joseph's story. Um, Rocky, you still cool with me? Mm -hmm. okay, cool. No, Joseph had been taken down to Egypt. Potiphar, an Egyptian who was one of Pharaoh's officials, the captain of the guard, brought him from the Ishmaelites who had taken him there. The Lord was with Joseph and he prospered and he lived in the house of his Egyptian master. 
When his master saw that the Lord was with him and that the Lord gave him success in everything he did, Joseph found favor in his eyes and became his attendant. Potiphar put him in charge of his household, and he entrusted to his care everything he owned. <clears throat> From the time he put him in charge of his household and of all that he owned, the Lord blessed the household of the Egyptian because of Joseph. The blessing of the Lord was on everything Potiphar had, both in the house and in the field. So he left in Joseph's care everything he had with, with Joseph in charge. He did not concern himself with anything except the food he ate. Now Ju Joseph was well built and handsome, and after a while his master's wife took notice of Joseph and said, Mom, do you want to do this line? Sure. Cool. Come to bed with me. But he refused. With me in charge, he told her, my master does not concern himself with anything in the house. Everything he owns, he is entrusted to my care. No one is greater in this house than I am. My master has withheld nothing from me except for you. Because you were his wife, how then could I do such a wicked thing and sin against God? And though she spoke to Joseph day after day, he refused to go to bed with her or even be with her. One day he went into the house to attend to his duties, and none of the household servants was inside. Were inside. She caught him by his cloak and said, Come to bed with me. But he left his cloak in her hand and ran out of the house. When she saw that he had left his cloak in her hand and had run out of the house, she called her household servants. Look, she said to them, this Hebrew has, has been brought to us to make sport of it. He came in here to sleep with me, but I screamed. Then he heard, when he heard me scream for help, he left his cloak beside me and ran out of the house. She kept his cloak beside her until his master came home. Then she told him this story. That Hebrew slave you brought us came to me to make sport of me, but as soon as I screamed for help, he left his cloak beside me and ran out of the house. When his master heard the story, his wife told him, saying, <clears throat> This is how your slave treated me. He burned with anger. Joseph's master took him and put him in prison, the place where the king's prisoners were confined. But while Joseph was there in the prison, the Lord was with him. He showed him kindness and granted him favor in the eyes of the prison warden. So the warden put Joseph in charge of all those held in the prison. And he was made responsible for all that was done there. The warden paid no attention to anything under Joseph's care because the Lord was with Joseph and gave him success in whatever he did. Oh, we can't end there. You guys want to go one more chapter? That's pretty cool. Yeah. Yeah, I'm good. Okay. What are you doing? If we have time, that's yeah. fine for me. Yeah, yeah. Uh, we got about 20 minutes left. We'll do this last chapter and then we'll take questions and talk about it and stuff. Okay. Um. So, uh, Rock, are you still okay being there? Cool. Uh -huh. ah, nice. so, sometime later, the cupbearer, the baker, the king of Egypt, offended their master, the king of Egypt. Pharaoh was angry with his two officials, the chief cupbearer and the chief baker, and put them in custody in the house of the captain of the guard in the same prison where Joseph was confined. The captain of the guard assigned them to Joseph, and he attended them. After they had been in custody for some time, each of the two men, the cupbearer and the baker, the king of Egypt, who were being held in prison, had a dream the same night, and each dream had a meaning of its own. When Joseph came to them the next morning, he saw that they were dejected. So he asked Pharaoh's officials who were in custody with him in his master's house. Why do you look so sad today? Uh, does anybody want to do that? On this one? Who, what, where? Uh, eight. No, oh, we both had dreams. They answered. But there's no one to interpret them. Then Joseph said to them, Do not interpretations belong to God? Tell me your dreams. So the chief cupbearer told Joseph his dream. He said to him, In my dream I saw a vine in front of me, and on the vine were three branches. As soon as it budded, it blossomed, and its clusters ripened into grapes. Pharaoh's cup was in my hand, and I took the grapes, squeezed them into Pharaoh's cup, and put the cup in his hand. This is what it means. Oh, this, oh. this is what it means. <laughs> Joseph said to him, The three branches are three days. Within three days, Pharaoh will lift up your head, 
and restore you to your position. And you will put Pharaoh's cup in his hand, just as you used to do when you were his cup bearer. But when all goes well with you, remember me and show me kindness. Mention me to Pharaoh and get me out of this prison. I was forcibly carried off from the land of the Hebrews, and even here I have done nothing to deserve being put in the dungeon. When the chief baker saw that Joseph had given a favorable interpretation, he said to Joseph, I too had a dream. On my head were three baskets of bread. In the top basket were all kinds of baked goods for Pharaoh, if the birds were eating them out of the basket on my head. This is what it means, Joseph said. The three baskets are three days. Within three days, Pharaoh will lift off your head and impale your body on a pole, and the birds will eat away your flesh. Oh. Now, now the day was Pharaoh's yeah. birthday, and he gave a feast for all his officials. He lifted up the heads of the chief cupbearer and the chief baker in the presence of his officials. He restored the chief cupbearer to his position so that he once again put the cup into Pharaoh's hand, but he hanged the chief baker, just as Joseph had said to them in his interpretation. The chief cupbearer, however, did not remember Joseph. He forgot him. And then, um, I kind of wonder how, uh, how Joseph broke the bad news to the guy. He's like, well, <laughs> fortunately, <laughs> yeah, but it's just a dream. <laughs> um, well, um, is this a good time to stop? Yeah. 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 Okay. Cool. Cool. It, any questions and comments? I can take comments from Facebook. Um, doesn't look like nobody has any comments so far. But oh, the camera's getting all weird. Oh yeah, it's weird. Has changed the angle. <laughs> yeah. yeah, it happens. Don't move, Darren. <laughs> You're on a higher chair, too, so that helps. That's kind of a trip. Don't move, Darren. <laughs> cool. Well, um, yeah. This is cool. This is getting really good into it. Um, we're about to see some cool stuff. It's tough to stop there, but I know we're crunched for time, so. Why did, um, thanks why for reading that. Put the chief baker in the in the cupbearer in prison. I can't really. I didn't register what I read. Yeah, I don't know. I I didn't re read this ahead, and I forgot. So let's go oh, back and look at it. Baker of the king of Egypt offended their master. The king of Egypt. Okay, so they offended him. Yeah. Okay. Right there, the first, in the first. I don't know why I didn't register it. Sometime later, the cupbearer and the baker, the king of Egypt, offended their master, the king of Egypt. Pharaoh was angry with his two officials. So, yeah. Hmm. It, you know, and it, it, um, it, it oddly reminds me of the you know, one where, where Haman uh, was impaled upon a pole. He was a bad guy, and the Pharaoh found out and, and impaled him. Um, and I think there's every reason to assume that the Pharaoh is a judging guy. He's trying to judge between two different peoples. They both did wrong. Um, here, uh, God was intervening um, on their behalf. Uh, he lifted up one. It's possible that he had real good morals, good character. Then God restored him. And the other one, he had bad character. The Pharaoh found out. And then the Pharaoh did whatever he wanted with him, which is, you know, which is horrible. It's absolutely horrible. Um, but there's it, kind of the same thing happened to Haman. And Haman was a bad dude. It's possible that, you know, there were, there were two different characters. And they both offended the Pharaoh at about the same time. And then uh, God, God kind of directed. It says in Proverbs, God directs the king like a water course. He directs him wherever he wants. Kind of uses the king. So, but, but, yeah. Um, that's what I'm gonna go with, since it doesn't have any details. Yeah. Um, I believe that's true. Yeah. Well, thanks. So any comments on uh, that stuff? Uh, I just kind of interesting. I, I, I've always kind of liked this story uh, just because how it works out in the end. But mm. when um, 
of the process. I kind of wish I could c connect more with uh, with Joseph. Mm. Of course, you don't really get that these type of details in scripture as far as what Joseph was felt like or how difficult it was for him. I mean, he's 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 a human, so I I try to imagine, you know, and I forget how long he was in the prison there, but yeah, um, just kind of. You know, in a way, maybe his faith is being tested, or something else is going on there. Yeah. To where, uh, you know, because he 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 obviously felt when he had those dreams that that what was going to happen, and here he is in a you know in a dungeon. He sold off to slavery, and now in the dungeon. I'm uh, sure he had some doubts. Some, yeah. On some days that. <laughs> yeah, 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 and, and isn't it funny? Uh, God works this way. Me too. I'll have a real encouraging like a really good dream um and then the next day will be bad and what god's doing i'm realizing is that he's implanting hope he's like don't give up hope you know good things are around the corner good things are coming um and i actually feel the same position in life right now um as as uh joseph i feel down i feel like why is this happening to me there's not a lot of um prosperity here in America anymore. I'm not in a position where I can easily work up. Things are tougher um, than they were back when I was working in the late 1990s, early 2000. Um, and I, I kind of, I'm at square one again. I'm studying for my CDL. I could have done that when I was 18, you know, been through so much college and I'm just like, what's going on with society? Why is it like this? Um, you know, I'm very well educated and there's just no jobs. Um, what's that? Yeah. But, uh, but so I'm making the most of it. I'm doing the worship music, which I love to do. Mm -hmm. And, um, uh, and the rest of it, I'm like, well, fine. If I have to work a job that I could work when I was 18, I'm not better than anybody else. I'll, I'll work it. Um, though it may not be my passion. And I might have failed at, at, you know, maybe in some way of, of not getting them. Well, anyway, there's a million things I could have done in the past, but, but yeah, I kind of feel like that that way too. Some days it feels like I'm in a, a work prison and my work has already told for me what I have to do and I just have to go through it. But mm. yeah, but it's good. But I have seen the other side. Um, I've been wealthy. I've been fine. Uh, it's good. You know, it's a definitely something to look forward to. We should never give up that hope. And so I think that God let me see that just as Joseph saw that in the dream. Mm -hmm. um, so... Um, if, if you can survive and you don't make much money, it doesn't, it's not really that big of a deal. You know, it's, uh, it's nice to make tons of money, but just living, just surviving is great. Um, <laughs> so, but, uh, but yeah, I love how God makes the dream come true. Um, he makes, he makes the prophecy come true. Joseph rises up and God rises him up. Mm -hmm. uh, the same thing happens in the book of Daniel. Um, where God rises up Daniel, and he's in a bunch of bad situations. We can tell it's God's hands on him because he just keeps rising up, rising up. After a while, Daniel goes, "I don't, I don't want all this money and power that you're throwing at me, O King." Because this is like the third time I've been mm -hmm. thrown in the dumps, and then God raised me up. And he's just like, "You know, when we were going through Daniel. Mm -hmm. He was like." You can keep your keep your gold Definitely rings, there, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. I like how even killed he was. It's like, mm -hmm. well, God's doing it. You know, I'm being a good guy. So the moral guy really does win in the end. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Cool, dude. I know you got to take off any comments before before you go. Uh, I don't think so. Okay. Kind of need to read it again. Yeah. <laughs> I didn't retain. That much information. Mm. Yeah, it's late at night too. It's like brain can be like done. Uh, Bryce, mom, did you guys have any comments? No, no. I think that you, you made a good point uh, in that um, at the this time where probably we've all felt like. Um, we don't deserve whatever it is that we're getting, mm. but um, to keep hoping, keep carrying on, keep doing the best, even in prison, he was doing the best that he could do, and um, 
people saw um, his righteousness through that. And I think that's a good point. Yeah, and you reminded me, Mom. So going in the military is kind of like going into prison. Um, they tell you when you eat, when you sleep, and you yeah. definitely they they take away your maps, so you can't escape, and they do it on purpose. Um, and it's they make your life a living hell. It's this harassment thing. You get three months of harassment. They take away your sleep, your food, and you know, all these things. And you're like, I'm in jail right now. You know, they have guards constantly, and they'll watch. Anyway, so I felt like I was in a prison. Everybody did. And anybody who's saying thinks that, but uh, um, I so what I, how I responded, I was really quiet and I just didn't poke my head out. I wasn't seen, I wanted to be left unnoticed and scooped by the evil drill sergeant guards. <laughs> um, but towards the end of it, um, I, and I tried to keep a good attitude, we kept encouraging it, each other. And at the end, one my drill sergeant they pick three. Uh, I don't want to say cadets, we're not going to be obviously, but they picked three young soldiers to go out and to represent the whole company to the officers. And I was picked as one of those. And I didn't think they even knew my last name, but, uh, yeah. but they did. And, um, and so uh, it was, I was like, they, they notice and they watch. And then the same thing happened to me in Korea. It was one of the hardest years of my life. Uh, it was, not right, horrible at time, but but anyway, um, at the end they were like, uh, he goes, uh, my sergeant goes, Palmer, come over here. And I go, yeah. And he goes, you're squared away, soldier. Get dressed up and go talk to these up higher guys. Tell them what's been going on. I'm like, yes, yes, sergeant. And uh, so I went and did that. And uh, yeah, it was it was like when you you may not be. I, I'm not. I'm short. I'm not the strongest soldier. I'm not the fastest soldier. But uh, I, I was noticed just because I was trying to do the right thing. And I think here in this situation. Cool. Your, your no, nobility was recognized? Yeah. <laughs> Yo, they noticed me. <laughs> yeah. All right. These strong, powerful men are, are good people. But I'm not. Yeah. But. And it also helps if you're a good shooter. You can be a small guy, but a good shooter. You know? Yeah. So. <laughs> so. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, but I can't. That's a good point, Chris. Yeah, <laughs> Not the shooting part, but but doing what's right. And even if yeah. people don't see it, God does. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And there are times when He rises you up, like that psalm that says, "I have set you above above your companions with by anointing you with the oil of joy, because of the joy you have in your heart." You're going to be set above your companions and people know like like every time i get together with you rock you're you're joyous in general you're i can tell you're overcoming your situation so it's it's really awesome and yeah there are times when god will will take us and put us ahead of people that when we didn't expect because he noticed it but nobody else noticed it and steps in well uh any other comments Okay. <laughs> All right. Well, I have something that God asked me to share. I wrote it down. Uh, we got five minutes left. Bryce, did you have any comments? I think he bailed. Yeah, but for some reason, my mute was on. Oh, gotcha. Okay. Oh, oh you're so quiet. <laughs> I was just saying, I've always been impressed by uh, the faith of Joseph. Showed to all that because then I mean, he started with being dumped in the well by his brothers, mm. and then he would, then he got sold as a slave. And as a slave, he still uh, expired uh, always and just constantly served God. And they would always say how he would kept his faith and his continually sought God. And mm. then he gets dumped in prison, and he keeps um, believing that that God, uh, in God more. One, sort of like when Daniel and all those came, they chose, they said they made a, a commitment to their heart. They weren't going to do, uh, go along. They weren't going to eat the king's meat. They weren't going to defile themselves. Yeah. That's the same thing Joseph was doing. Yeah. And he managed to keep doing it until God raised him to the promised position of his dreams. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Now, yeah, after hearing that, I'm convinced that he gave him that vision and that dream so that he'd keep hope. Mm. 
during that time. Mm. Yeah. Maybe I'll go get the, the paper that I wrote. You, you lost sound, you can't hear us? No, no, I can hear you. Okay. Oh, it's because we didn't say anything. <laughs> okay, so I started. Oh, is there any other comments before we close? All right, cool, cool. Well, um, so I started to analyze things. I was lying on the bed, and God kind of hit me with the revelation. Um, so right now, um, what they're hearing is pre-Christ. Um, and uh, there seems to be a trend that uh, from the events of Adam and Eve, the flood, the Tower of Babel, um, the forming of Israel, um, that um, all these events, there's this is pre-Christ, Christ, Christ uh, came, and now we're post-Christ, and then Christ is going to come again. And each one of those are huge events in the world, and I noticed a trend in, in every single one of those events. Uh, so let's take Adam and Eve for the first time. Their lifespan is that they were going to live forever, um, and then they mess up, um, and they get permanent consequences. We have to, um, we have labor pains. Uh, women have labor pains, and then men have pain doing manual labor. Um, but at the same time, Satan is limited. You know, he said that he was going to, man's going to walk on him and crush him. Um, and uh, so God doesn't prevent the bad thing from happening, but he does come in and he kind of steps a little closer. You know, he makes clothes for him, he makes garments for them. Mm. Um, in the flood, uh, our lifespan goes from 900. We all turn, everybody turned evil except one person. God's like, well, dang, you know, they all, he says he grieved in his heart that they made man. So God's like, okay, well, they're going to get the consequence. Their lifespan is only going to be a hundred years. Um, and uh, um, but he also seems to step in. He creates the nation of Israel, um, and he has his own country on the earth. So each, each and that that pattern continues throughout history. So we have uh, Jesus comes. God's waiting for a Messiah. No, nobody is the Messiah. Nobody is perfect. Jesus comes. He fulfills the righteous requirements of the law. Uh, Jesus was perfect. God's own arm. So. God's own arm worked salvation for him. Jesus accepts the cup of Messiah. And and so God redeems the world. Um, and so each time we fail, God gets a little bit closer. Um, and uh, we might have consequences afterwards. But he keeps getting closer and closer. And eventually, in Revelation, um, Christ will come back. But people will still not choose Christ, you know, which is so that being said, I realized that my primary call in life is to promote that Jesus was the Messiah and to go back to the Old Testament and prove how, how did he fulfill the promises of Israel? You know, he was he was through the, one of the family lines of Israel. Bryce, do you know which family line he was? Judah. Judah. OK, cool. OK. So. Um, so yeah, it's called so, the Lion of Judah. Lion of Judah, right. Right, cool. Yeah, and so Israel fails, Christ comes back and he redeems what Israel was supposed to be, a uh, spokesman to the world. And um in Revelation, Christ comes back again. Um and in Matthew, you know, God talks about the world, the world go cold, people will be lovers themselves, lovers of money, they'll be disrespectful of their parents. It's almost as if the church has failed. Mm -hmm. Um and then God comes in even more, and he steps even closer, and he sends Jesus back. And then in Revelation, people will know that Christ will be on the earth, and by saying that we'll even reign with Christ on the earth, but people will still not choose Christ. They'll still choose the devil. They'll still be evil, and it says in Revelation, let the evil be evil still, and the good be good still. And so 
Well, that's our primary call is to promote and preach Christ, that Jesus was the Son of God, and just how powerful and impactful that was. There will be a time in history where people will already know it, and, and the good people will be good still. Um, and, of course, we have good hearts, and, and we're going to be good. Um, but there will be evil and wickedness, and it will be even more intense and even worse battle. And eventually God will put an end to all of it. He'll throw Satan, he'll bind Satan, and he'll... Get rid of him completely, and it'll just be heaven, and we'll dwell with him, and he'll create a new heaven and a new earth. Um, but I thought it was interesting that each time, like my seminary professor said, the whole point of the book of Exodus is that God wants to be personally with his people. And so we see right now God is forming the nation of Israel, and he's, he's calling it his nation, and they're supposed to be the ideal nation on the earth. Um, and that's in a way he didn't do that before. So he's stepping in and he's stepping in and he stepped in us with Christ. You know, and we have that awesome relationship. We have the spirit of God through Christ. Um, and he's going to step in even more. And so I guess the personal application would be that. Um, um, we might lose authority when we sin, but God always makes up for our losses and he steps in and he comes closer to us um, when we do sin and that doesn't even matter if we uh, if we sin a whole bunch God still you know when we stop and recognize it my people would not call my my name would um, turn from their wicked ways repent seek my face you know come closer to God God comes closer to us and even if we fail um, he makes up for our wrong doings um, and though we rely on Christ for that wrong wrong doing um, just the encouragement that he's continually stepping into humanity. And um, um, it eventually comes into where he's just with us all the time. And that's why we look forward to Christ's return and we look forward to everything good. But yeah, um, kind of the way of re redeeming things, whether it's wrong done to us or our own wrong that we've done. He has a way of kind of using that to for the better of things. Mm. Uh, not, I wouldn't say that always, but I've certainly seen a lot of that in life. So. Yeah. 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 He is the bad and the good. So, mm -hmm. anyway, don't lose hope. Uh, might be saying it more for me but, uh, than anybody else, but I yeah, can't lose hope, uh, especially when you place a lot of emphasis on your own personal morals and then you mess up real bad. You're like, sometimes it can be really devastating. I can be really devastated because my strength is. Morals, no, my strength isn't morals. My strength is God's grace. Mm -hmm. And I'm kind of learning it's okay to live on grace, and it's okay to live in in just accepting weakness, put it in the past, of course, and go forward in his strength. But to really be confident and go forward in his strength whenever we mess up, whenever we sin, put it behind us, and just to keep going forward. Yeah. It's your daily dose of encouragement. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> so... Good, good. Okay, well, that's all I had, mm -hmm. I guess. And thanks for sharing that. Yeah, yeah. The theology of a diminishing lifespan of humanity. Um, oh, yeah, and the lifespan of humanity gets even shorter in Revelation because people are dying and stuff like that. And, um, yeah. Mm -hmm. So, but Satan loses. God wins. We just keep trusting that. So, let, let's close in prayer. God, thank you for uh, your story of Joseph. Thank you for um, just the just the colorful story that we have about uh, people being evil to him. And when things are evil to us, God, and we don't deserve it, God, we know that uh, you you take notice of that. You see, you come and restore. And just like you say in Jeremiah twenty nine eleven, for I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to give you hope in the future, plans to prosper you, not to harm you. We know that you did this in Joseph's life. You do this in ours. Um, in general, we prosper and we're awesome. And we know that um, you're blessing your Christians, you're blessing, blessing your church. And, and may we continue to be the light of the world. May we continue to preach Christ and to preach the gospel, to represent Christ to everyone around us, and to conclude that, that he was the Messiah. He is your son. And uh, uh, we thank you for your son. We thank you for grace and forgiveness to which we can enter into your holiest of holies and enter into you and to your presence and how your presence is now with us, God. Um, and we thank you for the prophecy and the pouring out of your spirit 
Um, we thank you for these stories and just we thank you how you're using your, your son and, and forgiveness. We can rely on your grace and how uh, you send your forgiveness every day. And we, and we live that out and we live Christ and we live his name. And we thank you for that and the closeness we can have in you, God, and how you wipe away every sin and cast it into the sea of forgetfulness, God. We thank you for that, and, and we thank you for the triumph at times when we do triumph over the, the enemy. We do triumph over the devil, and, and we go forward and we do good things, God. Um, we pray that you would send good things our way. Please bless us. Please bless everyone that heard this uh, message, God. Let us keep hope in you. Let us keep hope, and, and may we be uh, like Joseph, who keeps hope even during the times that we didn't necessarily bring upon ourselves, God. Um, we know that good morals do win in the end, and we thank you for that, God. And we pray that you would, uh, as in Psalm 91 says, we would tread upon the lion and the cobra, God, and, and tread down, crush Satan's head with our heel, and overcome him through the reading of your word and through worship, through your scripture, and through your goodness and your grace. And all these things we ask. Amen. Cool. Eight, oh, oh, I thought I said eight one. I'm like one minute. Okay. <laughs> oh yeah. Jagger failed. <laughs> what was me? Bye, Facebook. Love you.